Hello everyone and welcome back to this third lecture in my series on ordinary differential equations. Now, in the previous lecture, I introduced to you a number of different ways of talking about and classifying differential equations. In this lecture, we are going to put those new terms to use and in particular, we're going to describe a method of solving these ordinary differential equations. That method today is called integrating factors. Now, to work with integrating factors, we are going to work with first order. So first order, that means that there's only one derivative. Remember, we learned this in the last lecture. Linear, we know that the independent variable and all of its derivatives only show up linearly. And this is going to be a differential equation, DE. So how do we write these things? Well, we know that we can always write them as y prime plus, we're going to use p of t y, which is equal to g of t. This is sort of just a standard notation that's made its way through mathematics. So where this comes from, is from the previous lecture I told you that all linear ordinary differential equations can be written like this. a1 of t y prime plus a0 of t y. And in this case, we'll write this equal to, say, some external function b of t. Well, the way we get from here, or sorry, from here to here, is just simply dividing off that a1 of t term. So we're going to ignore the singularities for now and this here will give us our g of t and this here will give us our p of t. So what we're going to do for the entire lecture is focus on these first order linear ordinary differential equations. Now what I want to do is I want to walk through this method with an illustrative example. Okay. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you concrete numbers and functions to work with. Here it is. I want to have y prime plus 1 half y, which is equal to 1 half e to the t. Uh, let's do t over 3. Make it exciting. Okay. In this case, g of t is equal to 1 half e to the t over 3. And in this case, p of t is a constant function equal to a half. So here's the general idea, okay? So bear with me. I'm going to explain while I do, why I'm doing this as we go through. But I'm going to multiply by a function mu of t. So I'm going to take, I don't know what it is yet, but I'm going to multiply it into every single equation, left and right. So I get mu of t, y prime, plus 1 half mu of t, y, is equal to 1 half mu of t, e to the t over 3. Okay, so I didn't do anything but multiplied everything by mu of t. So you might be sitting at home thinking, well, you know, why, what was the point in doing this, Jason, right? The only thing that you did is added something else in there, and we don't even know what it is. Well, here's where the magic happens, okay? So what I want to do is I want to choose mu of t strategically that's going to clean this thing up right here. How am I going to do that? Well, I am going to remember something from calculus that I hope we haven't forgotten, and that is the product rule. Now let me show you something, okay? Again, bear with me. This will become clear after we sort of after I illustrate this to you. But if I take my function mu of t and I take my function y, I multiply them together and then I ask you what's the derivative of that thing? We don't have to know what the functions are, but we know how to apply the product rule. And this is going to give me mu of t times y prime plus mu prime of t times y. So all I did was use the product rule, nothing fancy. But what I want you to see here, that term is right there. So what I would like to do is have that term be that term right there. And again, I will show you why I want to do this, but I want you to sort of walk through it with me and enjoy the mystery for a moment. But what this says is that 
Okay, I've already got y's in both of them. So what we do is we want, we want a function mu so that its derivative, mu prime, is equal to one half of itself. Now, hopefully we don't have to think too, much, too hard about this. There is an entire class of functions that differentiate into themselves. You know what they are. They are the exponential functions. The only thing that might trip us up here a little tiny bit is that one half out front, but you can very quickly check that the solution here is e to the t over 2. Okay? If you want to, you can solve this in the same way that we solved the falling object uh, equation from the very first video, but for now we're just going to note that that thing is equal to t over 2. Now why is that interesting? Well, because I picked mu in such a way that these two things are equal, that means that this whole equation right here is equal to this, which is equal to this. Okay, so what's happening, right? Can we follow along? Well, this tells me, again, replacing this with this from our choice of mu with this, I get the derivative of e to the t over 2 times y, again y is unknown, is equal to 1 half, and now I have mu up here, which is e to the t over 2. I have e to the t over 3 right here. This gives me e to the 5t over 6. Okay, so what was the benefit of doing all of this? Well, look at what we've got on the, on the left here. I've got a derivative of just a single function. So the derivative of this thing is equal to whatever, some function. But I can undo derivatives, right? I can take an integral and I can isolate for e to the t over 2 times y that's inside of this thing, right? I can get rid of this derivative by just integrating the whole equation. So what happened here? Well, I found a function mu of t that allowed me to compact the left-hand side of this equation. It allowed me to not have the derivatives distributed, right? There's one derivative over here, no derivatives over here, but to put everything together so that all I have to do to get rid of the derivative now is just integrate, nothing fancy. So this gives me e to the t over 2 times y is equal to, this is an indefinite integral of 1 half e to the 5 over 6t dt, which we can do this, right? We spent all of that time studying calculus. This is easy for us now. So in this case, uh, we get 3 over 5 e to the 5 over, or 5t over 6. Do not forget the plus c. We remember from the very first lecture that the plus c helps us identify the general solution. So now life is good, right? Think about how awesome this is. All I need to do is divide off this e to the t over 2 term, and I've got my solution to the differential equation. So now by dividing that thing off, I get 3 over 5, and e to the t over 3 again, that's the 5 sixth minus one half and plus c e to the minus t over two. Look at that, it's a work of art and really the only thing, the only brain power that needed to be employed was other than just doing some integrals was just coming up with this clever way of figuring out what, uh, what my mu, my integrating factor should be. So let me summarize. What's the general procedure here? So generally, and in this case, it's going to be when p of t is equal to a constant. So it's a constant function. That's the, that is what we just dealt with. In our case, it was equal to 1 half. What is the general procedure here? Well, we are going to identify an integrating factor, and that integrating factor so let's look at this, y prime plus a y 
is equal to, say, g of t. Well, that integrating factor is going to compact up these derivatives or this derivative here and put a d dt on the outside so that I can just do straight integration. So we want mu of t so that mu prime is equal to a mu. A, that's my constant value of my p of t function. In my case, it was 1 half. Look at right here. That's mu prime is equal to a mu. That's what I did. And then this gives us that mu of t is equal to e to the a t. Okay? That's my solution of the differential equation. e to the a t, e to the a t, same thing. And then this will give me, when I multiply it through, I get e to the a t y prime plus a e to the a t y is equal to e to the a t g of t, which we do the same trick that we did right here, right? If you just follow all of the ideas here, this thing gets packed away by inverting the product rule. So this whole left-hand side is the same as asking for the derivative of e to the a t y, which is equal to e to the a t g of t. And again, same thing that happened here. Now we just have a derivative. All I have to do is integrate and isolate. So integrate plus solve for y. Right, so all I need to do is hit both sides with an integral. That makes this derivative term disappear. And now I'm stuck potentially integrating something that's kind of ugly. But, you know, in theory, we can always integrate this thing. Once I do the integral, then I just get rid of the e to the at term in the same way that I did on this side to give me y of t. Okay, let me do a little bit of mind reading for a second. You're thinking to yourself, uh, Jason, that looks like a, a wonderful method. But unfortunately, you know, I very, very rarely see constant functions. And so it would be nice if there was some sort of extension of this that worked for non-constant functions. Well, you're in luck. This, this does extend in a very, very straightforward way. And the way that we're going to do this is, again, with an illustrative example. Okay, So what I want to do is the same thing we did with the constant case, I want to walk you through an example, and then I'll give you the general method at the end. It's more important to sort of see how this is derived in an example. Let's consider, I'm going to give you, actually in this case, an initial value problem. So t, and then y prime plus 2y is equal to 4t squared. And I'm also going to tell you to isolate the solution where y of 1 is equal to 2. Here's the first thing that you're thinking. You're thinking, Jason, that p of t there, it certainly looks like a constant. But I want you to be very, very careful, right? If you look back, this is not in the form that my first order linear equations were that I gave you at the beginning of the lecture. What I need is I need nothing in front of my y prime. So I've got to do some division. So actually, to put this in the proper form, it should be y prime and then plus 2 over t y is equal to 4t. Right? So I divided the t off everything. And now I can see here's my p of t, here's my g of t. OK. So what do we want to do with this, right? What is it that, or how is it that we can extend the methods from the previous uh, example? Well, we could try by just multiplying through by mu again. Let's just kind of see what happens. Well, then we're going to get mu of t, y prime, plus 2 over t, mu of t, y which is equal to 4 mu of t times 
times t. All I did was multiply it in the t, or sorry, the mu of t. Now remember, we had this thing, right? This is what we always tried to get ourselves down to with the constant p equation. And we did it by finding mu so that this left-hand side became this little product rule that opens up. Let's try and do the same thing. Let's solve. Let's try solving in exactly the same way. So previously we had a constant here, we had a one half. Now we have a function of t, but we can handle this, right? Because again, mu times y prime, y. So it looks like all I want to solve is I want to find a function mu so that when I differentiate it, that's the same as 2 over t times mu. That's all that I want. It's exactly the same idea. The only thing that changed is now that I have a function of t in front there. And so the solution is not just going to be something like e to the at. OK, how do I solve this thing? I am going to proceed in the same way that I solved my motion of a ball uh, or of an object that falls in the first lecture. I'm going to divide off the mu. So this gives me, I'm going to write it as d mu dt over mu, which is equal to 2 over t. Then if you remember what I did in the previous or in the first lecture, I integrated everything. Okay, so when I integrate, remember the left hand side here, this piece, this can just be done using a substitution. So really what you could do is you could say let s equal to mu of t. Remember t is the only variable that's free here. Mu is just a covering of t. And this gives me ds is equal to, uh, let's say, mu prime dt. Mu prime is the same as d mu dt. So this whole piece becomes ds. This piece down here becomes s. So let's take a look at what we've got. We've got the integral of ds over s, sorry, over s, which is equal to the integral of 2 over t dt. OK, that's all right. We can work with this now. This gives me the natural logarithm of the absolute value of s. And this gives me 2 times the natural logarithm of t. In this case, we do not have to worry about the plus c because we're not looking for general solutions. We just need one function mu that works here. So I'm going to choose the function with c equal to 0 to make my life easy. But here what I can do is I can use some properties of the logarithm. This 2 comes up and gives me a t squared. And this gives me that s is equal to t squared after uh, getting rid of the logs which also gives me that mu of t is equal to t squared here. Okay, so now I got an integrating factor again, right? So now this is telling me that by solving this differential equation and using mu of t, the solution from that thing, equal to t squared, if I put that into here, then maybe if we can uh, sort of follow this, with some complicated arrows, if I use this mu of t right here, then from my sort of reverse product rule, I get t squared y is equal to 4 t squared times t, 4 t cubed. Now, not so bad anymore, right? Because now I have a derivative of a function is equal to something. That means that if I integrate, I get t squared y. And I'm not even going to write the integral because you can do this, right? Now you see why I had a 4 out front, because life is going to be easy. If I integrate both sides, I get t to the 4 plus c. And I know I'm at the bottom of my board, but let's just squeeze this piece in. This gives me the general solution which is going to be y of t is equal to t squared plus c t to the minus 2. 
the t to the minus 2 came from dividing off the t squared from the c term here. So in this case, the constant of integration is very, very important, right? That is helping us to get a general solution to our differential equation. And we can see that dividing off the t squared also knocked off two powers of t there. But that's it. Because now we're in a position to very simply and uh, solve this differential equation. Remember, the only piece that we have left is we have this initial condition, this initial value. So we started counting at t equal to 1 in this case. But here what we now have is, so since y of 1 is equal to 2, that means that if we plug t equal to 1, into this general solution, we're going to get a particular solution. So this gives us, well, 2, that's y at 1, which is equal to 1 squared plus c times 1 to the minus 2. Okay, so this is going to give me 2 is equal to 1 plus c which now life is good, right? C is equal to 1, and so therefore the particular solution to the initial value problem, right? So listen to what I'm saying. I'm using all of those new, that new terminology that we were given in the past two lectures. I get t squared plus t to the minus 2. That's my solution to the differential equation. This is a non, uh, this had a non-linear, non-constant even function for p of t in here, right? It was 2 over t, but I still solved it in exactly the same way. Nothing fancy, no really different process. So the question is, what is the general procedure here? Well, the general procedure is basically the same. So generally... Well, this is going to be non-constant p. But even here, very little is going to change, right? We are going to have, so we want mu of t so that mu prime is equal to Let's look at our differential equation that we had in the example. Mu prime is equal to 2 over t mu. Now, what was 2 over t? 2 over t was my p of t. So, I want to be able to find an integrating factor, mu, that satisfies this little differential equation. Now, you can have all the fun that you want solving that differential equation, you know, following all of my little methods right here. And if you want, go ahead and pause the video and see if you can, see if you can beat me to it. Because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you the general solution here. So if you follow what I've done here, this gives you mu of t is equal to e to the antiderivative of p of t, okay? So this is an indefinite integral, and I'm talking about this case is just representing the antiderivative of p of t. So just integrate it up. Whatever function differentiates into p of t, and then raise e to the power of that thing. Let's cross-reference. Does that make sense with what we had over here? OK, what is the antiderivative of 2 over t? That is 2 times the ln of the absolute value of t. Again, we if I take e to the power of that thing, that's going to be um, let's put it up here just because I don't want it to distract. e to the 2 ln of the absolute value of t. So just to double check that everything is looking okay, well, we just use the same thing that we just did. e to the ln of t squared, right? So we just brought that 2 up. We use the, the properties of the natural logarithm, or actually of all logarithms. And now t squared. Integrating factor is t squared. Integrating factor is t squared. Integrating factor is e to the antiderivative of p of t. So then what we get 
Then we have d dt of mu of t times y is equal to mu of t times g of t. So if you pick the perfect function to multiply into a linear first order ordinary differential equation, you can eventually write it like this and then integrate and solve. Woohoo, right? Clear sailing from all the way out there. So I would argue that now that you have the method in front of you, the hardest part of this thing, other than understanding it, right? So understanding this undoing of the product rule, other than understanding it, the hardest thing that stands in front of you in solving these equations is doing some integrals. Something that you are probably very good at now. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to come back with another method. Actually, it's going to be very much related to what we're doing right here. We're going to sort of formalize that. We're going to show how we can solve what are called separable equations. So in this section, in this lecture, we focused on integrating factors, and we know that they are for first order, linear, ordinary differential equations. Okay.